Everybody doing good? Yeah. You know, I missed you guys. Did you guys notice I was gone? Yeah. I was gone for two weeks. I'm back. And we're going to talk about marriage this morning. Revival starts with you. <laughs> I'm just joking. Just playing. <laughs> no more marriage stuff. Uh, we did put all the married stuff online, so if you did miss any of that, go and listen to it. Uh, yeah, so I'm glad you said it, because I can't, you know. <laughs> uh, but I, I encourage you, go check that out if you missed any of that. We also are going to be doing several marriage things this year. We're going to have Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. Some of you guys might be saying, I've been laughing my way through marriage the whole time. Um, I think I spend a little bit too much time in my joking box sometimes with my wife. Um, do you feel that way sometimes? Yeah. Last night we laid down for bed and she was just super talkative. Uh, it's like 11.45 maybe at night. We lay down to go to sleep and she was kind of talking. She's like, all right, let's pray. And she starts praying and she's just going after it, praying for the kids' spouses. And, you know, and I'm like, it's 11.45. <laughs> And so I pulled out my great line that I've said for many years, this is not a slumber party. <laughs> she then punched me in the throat and went to sleep. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I love messing with that lady and I love being with her. So, uh, and if you need great advice from this kind of a person, go check out those marriage things. <laughs> Uh, today we are going to cover a whole bunch of ground. I'm going to do my very best to get through this content. This has to be some of the richest content that Paul writes. Uh, in Romans 7 and 8, it really, we, we hit the ground. And I really truly believe, and I need you to listen to me on this, I believe, well, there's a couple things. Every single one of us in this room has, well, I don't want to get that deep into it yet. Um, I believe that if we will take what the Lord's going to show us this morning and apply it to our lives, revival will break out in Gig Harbor. Uh, I believe that the stage is set for it. You may or may not be aware of this. Pastors from all kinds of denominations are coming together and praying together every single month. Um, we, uh, those who are the spirit-filled pastors in Gig Harbor have been meeting together and just praying and asking for the spirit to move in Gig Harbor. And then we get together with all of the pastors, those who don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and everything else, and we all pray together. And there's something stirring inside of it. There's, a, there's another large church in town where they, are not, um, they don't walk in spirit-filled things as... Uh, as a, a regular part of their doctrine, and they're flirting with it. They're going, Amen. maybe we're missing something. Yes. That's powerful stuff right there. Yes. They're going, okay, hold on, maybe there's something a little bit more out there that we really need to take hold of. Maybe we need to relook at this whole gifts of the Spirit and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit does. Something is about to break loose in Gig Harbor. But I truly, truly believe that without taking what we're going to look at and applying it to our lives, we can thwart the move of the Holy Spirit. We could stop revival in our own city. And I'm not talking about something. How many of you guys have watched Revival Break Out? And it's just this small pocket of a, of a bunch of people acting weird and then it goes away. <laughs> not interested in that. Not at all. Um, but I'm interested in us truly being the men and women God called us to be, knowing who we are and walking in confidence and it causing revival, life, everywhere we go, over and over and over again. People going, I need that, I want that, I have to have that. What is it? And so I'm hoping that we can grasp that this morning. Does that sound pretty deep? Yes, yes it is. All right, Lord, we just ask that you would bless these, this time. I pray that these would be your words and not mine, Father. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and bring change where change needs to take place and bring healing where healing needs to take place. Set us free where freedom is needed this morning, Lord. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so some of you guys are going to be really mad at me. I'm going to read a lot of scripture to you, but I'm going to read it to you out of the NLT. I actually went and bought an NLT, and I know some of you guys have gone out and bought NIVs because you used to read NAS. You very likely might be buying an NLT because I might be reading this a little bit more often. I'm sorry, you'll have to love me anyway. 
Um, I do not like, and I'd love for you to look into this yourself, what they've done with the newest NIV version. Um, I don't like it when we do translations and we start pulling chunks of scriptures out and we start softening different things for social agendas. Uh, and that has happened deeply in the new NIV, and they have pulled the 1984 version of the NIV off the market. You cannot publish it anymore. Uh, and you may or may not be aware of this, but how many of you guys know that this is how our world works? They're sneaky and conniving, and, and it's just subtle things. And so uh, I'm jumping ship. I don't want to take place in any of it. And so... Uh, if you read the NIV, I'm not cursing you and saying you're terrible. I'm just going, you know what? I'd rather not even just be on that road. And actually, I kind of like how the NLT is reading. So I think NS NASB, great for studying. Great for going deep. I think it's a great tool for that. NLT, daily reading, phenomenal if you're like me, which is a little special needs. Uh, <laughs> NLT is awesome for that. Uh, so we're going to read out of the NLT Romans 7. 7 through 25, 25 verses. Are you ready for this? We are, yeah. Here we go. Um, I have to switch on two computers. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the, commands not to, learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my con condemnation to death. So that, uh, sorry, so we can see how terrible sin really is. It, it uses God's good commands for its own evil purpose. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human. Everybody say amen. amen. A slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person, sorry. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will f free me from life, sorry. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. How many of you guys go, they just read my mail? Like he, I, I totally agree. I'm, I, I don't understand this. If I am, in fact, a new creation and set free, why do I keep sinning 
over and over and over again. Why is it that I can't beat these things? Why is it that I can't seem to get past this? I pray and I ask and I, and I, and, and, and I just keep coming back to it. Why? And then on the other side of that, the enemy comes in and he starts lying and he says, you'll never beat it. And God's disappointed in you and he hates you and you're disgusting. And he turns you towards verses and he says, see this, if you remain stiff-necked for over and over again, God will destroy you beyond remedy. You're probably not even saved anymore. He probably already gave up on you. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm, I'm, I'm talking here... <laughs> I'm not alone in this, right? No. I mean, if I'm alone in this, then let's go ahead and do the blessing and stand and go home. But I don't think I am. I'm pretty sure that what I just said is the same thing that Paul said, and it's the same thing for 2,000 years that we've all been dealing with. Every single day. And I believe that today it breaks. It's done. And we take a look at this and we go, okay, what is Paul saying? Because he's saying, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I do do, I don't want to do. But I'm innocent. What? How? Yeah. And we don't understand that. But I'm going to show it to you. And we're going to break some lies open from the enemy. But first thing we're going to do is we're just going to take some time just looking at the law. Because here's part of the problem. Is we don't have the same outlook as Paul as the law these days. Because we're Americans. <laughs> we're set free from the law. Hallelujah. <laughs> No, like we're set free from the condemnation that comes from the law, but we're still under the law spiritually in who we are as sons and daughters. We're just set free. When it says that I am no longer a slave, I'm set free, I'm not, no longer condemned by the law. That means that the law came and said this is right and wrong. You will never be able to be right. And so therefore you are dead and when Jesus came and he says, I didn't come to abolish the law or get rid of it, I came to fulfill it. He changed it to where when we look at the law and we see it, it goes, oh, you're a follower of Jesus? No condemnation. It's the next verse in what we just read. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're going to get to that next week, but let's just take a moment to look at the law. Here's some things that we see here, okay? Uh, we see that the law is like a mirror. The law shows man what was right or what is right and, and made uh, a way for man to judge his actions. Man and woman, okay? I'm just trying to keep the sentences a little shorter, okay? So if I say man, I, I mean man and woman. Are we all on the same page? Yeah. And I'm going to say man and woman at different times. But I'm not going to say woman because it just doesn't flow out of me when I'm typing, okay? Because I've never been one. I don't plan on being one. I don't plan on acting like one, okay? Uh, and I love you, and it's going to be okay, all right? But Paul tells us that the law shows us what is right and wrong. We just read it in verse 7. It says this. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. He's, he's talking about the law. And, and you've got to understand that what Paul's saying right here is this. When he's talking about the fact that uh, of, of what he's saying to the law, to Jewish people, the, the law of Moses was like, you don't mess with it. You don't talk about it. You follow it. And to say that you're not under the law is, oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? So he's trying to open something up, but he's trying not to throw the baby out with the bathwater here too. He's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not saying the law is bad. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. And I would never have known what coveting Sorry, that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. The law acts as a mirror for us. Without the law, mankind has no way to know what is just and holy. We would be guessing at what pleases God. As the law works as a mirror for us, we look and we see this reflection. You, how many of you guys look in a mirror every single day? Yep. You know, I love on Survivor sometimes, like they, if you watch that show, they go several days and they're just stinky and ugly and stuff. And then they finally give them a mirror, you know, and they're like, oh my gosh, look at me, right? And they see this reflection that is, that's not what they saw in themselves. How many of you guys, and we've talked about this, how many of you guys love to see yourself on video? <laughs> it's not a very common thing, right? Because everybody's like, I didn't know I had an overbite. You know, I, 
what? I don't have any hair? You know, I'm that fat? <laughs> you know, we were in here messing with the camera. Uh, where's Kevin at? And I was changing the skew of it. So it went really wide. So Kevin goes walking by and he's like, <laughs> he's like, am I that fat? I'm like, no. I clicked the button and it brought him back to normal. <laughs> but when we see ourselves in a reflection, what happens is this. Our self-perspective, which is always skewed, comes into correction. So when we look into the law as a mirror, we go, I'm a righteous person. And then we look into the law as a mirror and we go, maybe I'm not a righteous person. Maybe that reflection isn't what I thought. Now stick with me, okay? Because I know some of you guys are going New Testament on me already. Just stick with me, okay? <laughs> it's going to be okay. But, and, and I even put that, this is why, so uh, the law works like a mirror for us. We look into it and we see our reflection and our reflection tells us how we're doing. This is why it's so important for us to not write the law off as Old Testament. We still need these boundaries. And, and let me tell you something. Do you want to know what the law is for us now? It's right here. All of it. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's the Word of God. Even Paul didn't have this then. It was being written in that time. It was the Lord pouring out through man and pinning his word, his law, for you and I, for you and me as believers to be able to look at this and go, this is true, this is just, this is a mirror. What does it say I ought to look like and how do I look? Stick with me, okay? We're going to apply Jesus in just a moment. We don't live under the, the requirements of the law. We've been set free from that. But, right, but that doesn't mean that our righteousness doesn't come from our response to the law. It's just what God gives us. It's what God does in us. And I'm going I'm to go past that because we're going to unpack that a little bit more in just a bit. All right, James 1, 2, or 1, through 25 says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, interesting, huh? That sets you free. And if you do what is, it says, you don't forget what you heard. And then God will bless you for doing it. When we throw the mirror out, we actually lose a tool that God has given us to strengthen us and give us confidence. Because when we're right with God and we look in the mirror, we see the reflection of Jesus. You know what's interesting with the whole camera thing is nobody likes to see themselves on camera, but the person who's looking through the camera always says this, you look fine, you look great. How many of you guys have heard that? You're like, no, I don't. I didn't know this, this, and this. Because the person looking at you, they don't see your reflection, what you see. They see you for who you are all the time. And so when, when you look in the mirror, you see one thing, but if you were to stop and pause and look from another perspective, you would see what's always there. And it's something worth loving. It's something great. It's something that God does love. Just because we look in the mirror and we see all of our flaws doesn't mean that that's what God sees. That mirror ought to reflect back the grace of Jesus. When we look in the mirror, when we look at this, do you know what reflection we ought to see? Jesus with scars on his hands and his side where he died for us and he covered us with his blood. When Jesus or when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin when you've asked Jesus into your heart, when you're following the Lord, he doesn't see that. He sees somebody who's covered by the blood of his son. In other words, when God looks at us, he sees us marked by his son as I love this and it's great and it's amazing. If I find a little doll on the ground at my house, which is an easy thing to do, and I find that, or, or this, a piece of paper, Oh my goodness, Emma Joy Bowman. She writes on everything and she pulls everything out and markers and everything else and then she leaves it everywhere. But when I pick it up and it says, I love my mom and dad and, or Jesus is my friend, 
I'm not so quick to just throw that away, right? I'm kind of like, that's really cool, you know? And I find those and I keep those. It's the same thing with God. When he, when he looks at us, he doesn't see us as a piece of paper thrown on the ground. He goes, look it, my son marked this one and said, this is mine. And this person is covered by the blood of Jesus. They're, they're reflecting the glory of God. That's exactly what it says here in First or Second Corinthians three seventeen. It says, "For the Lord is is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom." So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we change into His glorious image. So we have to see that, that the, the law, the word, as we look at it, I'm going to pull some notes out here. I had a catastrophic fail in computers, so I'm doing both of them at the same time. So I'm going to make it through, though. The law works as a mirror, but there's another thing that we must see in this, and that is that the law provokes our sin nature. We just talked about this a little bit, and Paul says it like this in Romans 7, uh, 8 through 10. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would have that wouldn't have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the commands, the command not to covet, sorry, for, for instance, the power of sin came to my life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Paul quotes the 10th commandment here, uh, of thou shall not covet. And when you look at the word that Paul's using, it's not just the, you, you shouldn't want your neighbor's thing, or you shouldn't see a Ferrari and want it. When you break down actually the Greek word and the Hebrew word that ties to that, you see this. You see a word that applies to, to, to covet as we know it, wanting things. But we also see a word that, in our, that would communicate sensuality in it as well. So what he's saying is, is he's saying, I lust after things. You shall not lust after things. And that would apply to things that maybe he wanted or position that he wanted, or even sensuality in regard to sexual lust. Paul's being as honest as he can with us. He's saying, I'm just like you. There's this stuff burning inside of me. And and, and, and what I don't want to do, I do. And what I do want to do, I don't do. Paul, the super apostle. What is going on with that? So we have to understand this. We have to see that as we look at the word, it's going to provoke something in us. It's not going to just, you, you know, often we say, just read your Bible and you'll be good. No, actually not really. You need to be reading your Bible. We're going to talk about that. But that doesn't just mean that everything's going to be good. Oh, I read it in the Word. I know exactly what to do. Right? I can handle anything. I read the Bible this morning. It provokes stuff in us. The moment we read it, then we, and we go, oh, Lord, you're so good. And the last thing I want to do is covet. The last thing I want to do is lust like that. So, Lord, from now on, I'm not going to. You walk outside and yaw! What just happened? I just read it in the Word. Why am I not? Because there's more to it than that. And we've got to see that it's actually going to provoke that, the, the sin nature in us. So we're going to come back to that in just a moment. So the law, uh, God's commandments, there's more than 10 of them. The first thing we see is that the law is a mirror for us. The second thing we see is that the law provokes sin, our sin nature. And then I put this one, the law is both wonderful and terrible at the same time. Let me just tell you this. It's not the law that's terrible. It's just what happens because of it. Why don't you guys turn with me? We're going to turn over to Roman or to John 8, 1 through 11. Uh, you've probably all have heard this story. This is the woman caught in adultery. So Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he went back again to the temple. Where do you think he would go in the temple? Into the courtyard. Okay. So there was this big courtyard. Do you know what the courtyard was like? I just heard, uh, I was just talking with somebody and they said this. It's like Facebook. 
It's the social place. Like you would come into the courtyard of the temple, you would sell different things, you tell everybody the newest news, you'd show them your newest sheep or show off your great donkey. Yeah, look at it down there. You see it? I just got it. New tires. Uh, this is where everybody hung out and talked. All of the talk happened there in the courtyard. And so the, Jesus is there and he's teaching. And it tells us this. A crowd soon gathered and sat down and, and uh, he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. So they just pretty much went live stream. Look at, we just found this chick. Facebook Live, look what's going on. All right, Jesus, let's, go, let's take a look at this. What are you going to do on this one? So the teacher said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. He stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest. I love that because the young guys don't know when to shut up, right? The old guys are like, and I'm out. <laughs> and the young guy's like, and then I'm ready. And they're like, hey, shut up. Look at what he's writing. That's probably what it happened, right? So on this Facebook Live, Jesus is in the comment section saying, oh, this is interesting. Well, last week you did this and that and this and this. And all of a sudden, Doof. right? Facebook Live just went offline because they don't want anything to do with it. So uh, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd uh, with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, I think in this story, we can see something really important about the law of how great and wonderful it is. And I think this is what we find is that the woman caught in adultery. The law tells us that what she did is wrong. That's, that's part of the rule, the, the part of the law. Uh, then the law also says that the punishment for this is death. So it's saying this is wrong and this is what ought to be paid for. But also we see this, the law also makes way for grace that she might be forgiven. Notice this, Jesus' response could have been, yes, actually, let's fulfill the law. And that would have been righteous. It would have been okay if Jesus said, you're right, uh, she should be stoned to death. But he didn't do that. In other words, he paused on, on doing what was the right thing to do and made way for grace to lead to repentance. See, sometimes when we just come in with the law, this is good and bad and we must do this, we might miss it that God's going, hold on, grace. I want to apply some grace. You know, Romans 6, uh, or I think it's 2, 4, says that, that his kindness leads to repentance. In other words, when, when, when Jesus gave her grace here, he made way for repentance. So she, if, she, if he would have just applied the law, then we would have seen that she would have died in her sin. But because he applied grace to the law, it actually made way for her repentance so that she might be free and is probably now in heaven with the Lord. Isn't that an amazing thing? So the law can be really great and really, uh, at the same time, we got to see this, all right? All right, I want to get past the law. So we need to, uh, as we're looking through this, we need to identify some things with us. I'm having a hard time doing both of these at the same time. Sorry. Uh, so uh, we need to identify some real problems. I'm going to do this. I'm going to try and just go like this. I'm going to preach just from right here. Does that sound all right? So we need to identify the real problem. There is a struggle within. We already talked about it. How many of you guys, by raising a hand, could go, I totally identify that. I understand about the struggle within. Come on, let's be honest and real. Yep. There's a struggle within us. And if there's not, let's talk even more. Uh, we must identify that there is a war within each and every single one of us. 
Romans 7, 15 through 25 says this, and I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered the principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin still within me. We've got to identify this. You know, I've said this to you guys many times. The worst thing is that you could do is be in a fight and not know that you're in a fight. We're in a fight. There's a fight happening within us, and we have to identify that. So we must see that there is a war between spirit and flesh within us. Now, let's take a look at this. This is us. It's beautiful, right? My own creation. I made it on my computer. And within us, we see three things. We see this. We see that we are body. Everybody got a body? Some might have more body than what they want. Some may have less. Who knows? But we all have a body. We have a mind. And we have a spirit. We're a three-part made-up person. And we need to understand this. Our society tries to say that this isn't true. This is true. Body, mind, and spirit. Every single one of us. All right, but let's break this down a little bit. So there's you again. Uh, I'm going to do my best to do this right. And in us, we're going to see a couple of things. We see two different natures within us. We see this one right here. Body. And that body is going to die someday. There is going to be a time that every single one of us die. Okay? And at that time, we will see a separation between the differences within us. We're going to see this, that our sin nature and our body will die. And then our spirit, our personality, your mind, and your eternal being will continue on forever. It doesn't matter if you're saved or not. It's very important for us to understand this. Every spirit lives for all eternity. And that is why God has commissioned us to do work. We are eternal beings, not just on the other side of salvation. You've got to understand this, that those who do not accept Jesus are still eternal spirits. And it's important for us to realize this. Okay, so let's take this a little step further. Here's us again. And this is us on earth. Oh, hold on. I messed up. Here's us, okay? And here's us. <laughs> we asked Jesus into our heart, and this should happen right here. Our plans, our will, our desire, our life, it should die, right? And we should live as this new creation, but this new creation has something going on inside of it. And this is what's going on. We see that we are flesh, and we see that we are spirit. And so in this, we see that our flesh, our body, our sin nature, our desires to do evil, one day this portion of our being will die. But for now, we got to be roommates with it. <laughs> like... <laughs> There's no getting away from it. Anybody ever have a bad roommate? I've had some doozy of roommates, not Carrie. <laughs> uh, and man, it can be rough, right? But then we have this other part in this, and this is our spirit side. This is the new creation part of a believer. This new creation desires to serve God. This portion of our uh, being consists of our mind and our personality and our character. And that's an eternal part of us. It's going forever. But this is happening in us. We have this war going back and forth between flesh and, and spirit. And we have to be aware of it. And then we also have to do this. I'm gonna, I don't know why that's there, but... Oh, I see it. Um, yeah, I'm going to go past this. We're going to come back. Uh, all right. Forget that. That's the biggest thing that I wanted to show you. Okay? Here we go. We're just preaching off of this. Next week I'll fix my computer. I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of do that visual aid for you because we need to see this. I think that there's a huge amount of who we are that is just found in the truth of just seeing what's happening within us. That there is this war. And, and, and what Paul says here is he says, this war is happening within me and I don't even know what to do about it. 
I don't know, I don't know how to fix this. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know how to make it go away, but I do know this, that when I do something wrong, but I wanted to do something good, I'm found justified still by God. And I think the very first thing you guys have to get, that we all have to understand, is that the war is happening within us. It's not going away. And when it's there, we are not condemned by what's just happened. But God doesn't hold us to that, and he goes, you're condemned by that. And I think if we can understand that, then we'll just be able to go, okay, I am set free. And then there's a whole other part of this. It's not just going, okay, God's forgiven me, but how do I stop doing this? Because that's an important thing. The war is always going to happen, but habitual sin within us doesn't have to stay. We're always going to have sin, but we ought to be conquering things as we go forward. Let me just push through a little bit of my notes, and we're going to go a little further on that. So where do, uh, we must identify that there's a war within each of us. We must be honest with ourselves. Are we winning the war or not? That's an important part of this. If you're just like, oh, you know, I'm set free, and I'm not, nope, that's not a big deal, and we're not paying attention to what's actually happening in us, and we're justifying it and different things, that's, a, that's not good for us. It's not good for us to dwell on it and be down about it, but it's good for us to identify it and go, the fruit of my life is not one who is being led by its spirit, it's actually one who's being led by his flesh, and I don't want that anymore. I want to push past that. And so we have to be working in that way. So uh, we must be honest with ourselves. And then we must break the apathy of allowing sin just to be there. Oh, I'm never going to beat it. It's never going to change. I think the enemy loves when we get to that part. And, he's going, and, and God's going, no, no more. No apathy in this. I've called you to be victorious. And so let's look at how we do that. Where do we start? We have to start with ourselves. What am I doing to grow spiritually? I've said this, and I've said it really lightly, and I've said, you know, I, I suggest that you do this in the morning. Let me tell you a story. What if there was a cop that you knew, and that cop was like, oh, I'm not a morning person. So I like wake up five minutes before I have to go to work, and I don't even have time to put on my bulletproof vest. So... I just get up and I go, and when I get home, I put my bulletproof vest on. Don't worry, I am, I am putting my bulletproof vest on each day. Uh, but I, I don't have time, I'm just not a morning person. I just put it on when I get home. Okay. All right. right? I guarantee you that if he was standing in front of somebody pointing a gun at him, he'd go, I wish I would have gotten up early and put on my bulletproof vest. Right? Okay, can I just tell you something? Mm -hmm. You choose how your day goes. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're a morning person or not. If you're not starting your day off with the Lord, you're hosed. <laughs> you are. I, I mean, it's, if you're not starting your day off with the Lord, you're going to get home and see all of the bullet holes in you that should have been gone or not there if you would have put your vest on. You're going to see all the things that you should have done differently. You're going to see all of the things or actions that you did that, yeah, maybe I should have responded to that differently. It doesn't matter. Listen, I would love to see you standing next to Jesus dying on the cross today. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to spend time with you, but I'm just not a morning person, so it's it's just going to be at a convenient time, okay? You go on continuing to die for my sins. But I'm not going to take hold of that power at the right time in my day. I'm going to take hold of it at the wrong time. And yes, I'm being super judgmental here. But this is half our problem. The, the word says this, that the enemy is seeking who he may devour. And you know, we see that, we go, yeah, he's alive and well, and he's out there seeking who he may devour. Let's pay attention to those words. Who he may devour. Are you devourable? Are you making yourself devourable? Because he's seeking who he can devour. He's not seeking who he can't devour. There's some real truth to that. You guys should be like, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, that just set me free. The reality is, is half of the attacks we go through could be gone in our lives if we weren't so devourable. I make, thank you. I'm, I'm making up a new word, devourable. 
Are you devourable? If the, if the enemy's out seeking who he can find, does he look at you and he goes, whoa, not that one. I ain't picking a fight with that. Or does he go, ha, easy. Come here. Come on. We, we have to not be so devourable. And I'll tell you this, spending time in the word and putting on the full armor of God before we walk out the door makes us less devourable. Half the attacks that we, will, we would go through would go away if we just started our day out right. Get up just 30 minutes earlier and spend time with the Lord. Get in his word. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to go in front of you and to be your right guard, your left guard, your front guard, and your, back, your rear guard. Just set yourself up so when you walk out there, you're not so devourable. And then in this, remove things that make it so easy to do it. We're Americans. We love to be comfortable and we're not under the law and so we can do whatever we want. Listen, can I tell you something? If you're struggling with sexual things, like if you're, if you're struggling with sexual thoughts or uh, just being like just ignited within you, within your, 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 your desires and lusts, as Paul says here, Remove some things out of your life. You guys want honesty time? I've quoted a bunch of movies from the 90s for years. Shake and bake, baby. Right? All righty then, right? All of these different movies. And finally, I caught my boys up. I'm like, hey, I'm going to show you guys Ace Ventura, Talladega Nights, you know? So we watch all of this stuff. Oh my gosh. PG-13. All kinds of sexual innuendos and jokes and everything else. And you know what I found myself doing? I found myself struggling going back to who I was before after watching those movies. But they're only PG-13. Or do I choose to make myself devourable? Do you know that before I went and took OSL 1, there was something really alive in me? And that was this. That's what she said. I was the king of that's what she said jokes. I would turn any comment into a perverted, that's what she said. Oh, I walked across the rug, that's what she said. <laughs> anything, anything. And the Lord said, that dies today. And I stood up in front of the staff who reported to me at Northwest Church, and I repented. And I said, I've joked in an inappropriate way, and I repent of it today. And I asked that you would forgive me. And it dies. And I hear the jokes. And people still throw that that's what she said. And, and it's hard to just go, ah. But I've chosen to separate myself off. Paul says it like this in Ephesians. He says, the temptation known to the Gentile. In other words, there's temptations that the Gentiles know that the Jews don't know. And do you know why that is? They separate themselves off from some certain things. If you're dealing with sexual things, stop watching sexual content. If you're dealing with negativity, depression and stuff, get off Facebook. Please, for the love of God, you know what I did one time? My parents were watching way too much TV. Love to rat you out. <laughs> the TV was on all the time. I would come home and God was doing this huge work in me. And my dad had just got this new uh, big screen TV, uh, but which back in that day, they were like this fat. Do you guys remember that? And they sat on the ground and they had three lights in them and everything. And I walked in, I went and got the scissors, I unplugged the cord, shump, cut it off, grabbed a piece of tape, and taped it to the front of the screen. Can you make a bigger statement than that? I don't know why he didn't kill me, but I was just like, enough is enough. Some of you guys need to go home and unplug your computer and chop off the cord. Because if you really want to take hold of revival, if you really want to be the man and women that you're called to be, then you will be more than happy to let go of some of the creature comforts of America so that you can be the person God called you to be. Will you separate yourself off? I'm doing it, and I'm doing it more and more and more. I watched those movies and I went, oh my gosh, I'm not that person anymore. And I don't want anything to do with that. Start removing things from your life that will keep you from doing what you don't want to do. You can fix some of that. Right. And you can do it by taking some things out of your life. 
If you're doing too much of something, man up, woman up, put on your big panties and do what you're supposed to do. Some of you guys might need to throw your phone away and get a flip phone. Do it. Some of you guys might need to get rid of your computer. Do it. Some of you guys are depressed and you spend every waking moment in your house looking at all of your circumstances and woe is me. Get out and serve somebody. There is a, a rescue thing in Tacoma. What's it called? The Union. Go serve lunch. Get out of where you're at. Because greater is he who's in me and he has a calling for me and a purpose for me and what I don't want to do, I do do and what I do do, I don't want to do and all of that can go away. It can go away if we're just pursuing God at a greater level every single day. I refuse to stay where I am. And the reason we have to do that is because he gave us a commission. He called every single one of us to do something. He said, I love you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I made you with purpose. Now go and do it. And the only way you'll be able to do it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have to take hold of that. We need to show some disciplines in our lives. We need to take hold of the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to go and do. And refuse to be apathetic in it. And I'll tell you this. You have to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you guys got a phone in your pocket? Right? Most of us have a smartphone. Raise your hand if you have a smartphone in the room. I just spent last weekend up at a retreat in Buck Creek. And there's something really interesting that I found about Buck Creek. No cell coverage. No TV antenna. I took my RV and I'm like, well, at least I'll be able to pick up a little... Nothing. Nothing. It's like a biodome. Like, you're just, you're out there. So I have my phone. And my phone is a really nice phone. Look at this. Ooh, nice phone, right? And there's some interesting things about my phone. It has apps and it can connect all this stuff and it can pull all of this information. But there's something very important about that. Connection. Yeah. The value of this doesn't go away without the connection. But it only really truly becomes what it was made to be when it has cellular connection. Mm -hmm. I needed to look up some information about Zach's food. I couldn't do it. I had the app. I could type into the app, but there was no connection. It went nowhere. Do you see what I'm saying here? In our walk with the Lord, He said, listen, I've established you. But there is a connection that you must have for you to really, truly operate and be who I've called you to be. You have to be connected to the Holy Spirit. You have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's only at that time that you really, truly will operate how I want you to operate and need you to operate. You might be able to play a couple of games by yourself. You might be able to type in a really cool thought, but you'll never be able to share it. It will never go anywhere without that connection. We have to take hold of the connection that God has created for us, and it's called the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me just say these things to you. I'm way off from my notes. You ready? What I want to do, I don't do. And what I do do, I don't want to do. But I am not condemned by the Lord in it. Number one, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Number two, there is victory to be found. And in that, we have to be less devourable. And we do that by a couple of great things. Showing some disciplines. Take away some of the stuff in your life. It's worth doing. Some of you guys are sitting here going, no way, I can't do that. You don't understand. I don't. I don't understand why you would cling to death. I don't understand why I did it. I did it for years and in different things I had to just let go. And God has done a work. You guys have no idea who your pastor is. <laughs> None. Like you guys are like, I can't believe he says some of the things he says from the pulpit. You should have heard me on the street. New creation. And I've had to get rid of a lot of crap in my life. There was a time where my family was having conversations going, what happened to Joe? Where did he go? I was unrecognizable in my sin. 
But God was unrelenting and he chased after me. And he said, I want these things put to death. And I chose to put those things to death. And I grew and I grew and I grew. And he keeps saying, I want that to die and I want that to die and I want that to die. And he's doing the same thing in every single one of you. And if you'll do it, you will look back and you'll go, I don't even know who that person is. And I won't even want to know those feelings again. But I'm this new creation who's consistently moving forward. We have to be that. And we have to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Behind that door, there's brochures about baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, uh, what we believe and how we walk in that. Grab those, read those, pursue the Spirit, pursue the Word. Read the Word before you go about your day. I don't care if you're a morning person or not. If she can do it, oh my gosh, anybody can do it. Because when I first met her, it was like, holy cow, like, are you alive? Or she would wake up and it was just like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, uh-huh. <laughs> yes, Satan. <laughs> She's got, but she does it. She gets up earlier than I do. She sets an alarm and she, she wakes up and I'm like, bye. <laughs> you know? And she goes in, she drinks coffee and she spends time with the Lord. Doesn't matter. Push past it. Can we do this? If you do this, if we can do this, we will grow. And in that, revival will spring forth. Can we just read our conclusion and we'll be done? Notice the title of this message is Revival Starts With You. And we haven't spent very much time talking about revival. The reason for that is seeking revival will never bring revival because revival is not something found or contended for. Revival is a byproduct of repentance. When we truly start repenting, turning away from sin, people see the victory in our lives and will be drawn to us because they see something they must have. Do I need to read that again or are we okay? The world needs to see the power of God in us so they are drawn to repentance and a victorious life. Let's, can we read this together? Let's walk in victory as men and women of repentance, power, and purpose and watch revival spring forth. Amen. Are you guys with me on this? Would you stand? Guys, we've got to go deeper. Like, I just felt like the Lord over the last few weeks just said, I'm turning the heat up. I want more. And we're launching stuff. Pay attention to your bulletin. We have account for guys in the morning, account for guys at night, account for students in the afternoon, women's Bible study, men's Bible study, marriage stuff. We're going after it. OSL. OSL is going through OSL 2, and then we're going to be launching OSL 1 again in April, and then we're going to be going back into OSL 2. There is opportunity to grow because God's going, this year we are finishing the foundation. We're setting some things in place, and I I need my people to be active because we are going to go and revival is going to come forth. And I can't do it on my own. I can't. So hopefully me up here spitting at all of you guys for an hour would encourage you to go, yes, I'm taking hold of this. And I'm going to move and I'm going to grow and I'm going to do. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would light a new fire in us, Lord, that we would seek after you. I I pray, Lord, that we would not be so devourable, but we would be something that the enemy sees and says, no way, no way am I going after that. Lord, I pray that we we would have the discipline needed to throw away the things that keep us from growing in you, Father. I pray, Lord, that we would unite together with one another and we would hold each other accountable and we would grow and move into who we're supposed to be, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we would take hold of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of your Spirit, the precious promise and gift that it is for every single one of us, Lord. Not for the sake of weird, but for the sake of power. We love you, Lord. We commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you power and purpose and peace as you go. In Jesus' name, amen.